first form. Good to see you, Ben. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, okay. Reunion. Reunion. We're reuniting. Reunioning. We're reuniting. 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 <laughs> yes, reunion. Yeah. With uh, John Clayton and John Hamilton. That's yeah, very nice. you know. Very swinging. Yes, this was a really, this is a great project and I'm really happy about it. Yeah. It came together so easily considering all of the parts and all of the history. Okay. It, it um, once it happened, of course, it was about 12 years in the making, really, because um, it's all about this guitar. Here, okay. Which, yeah. Which belonged to Barney Kessel. Right. And Barney was not your typical guitar. You know, most guitar players are like Mel DeMarco's with shoes. You know, they have lots of guitars. Right. You know, right, right. A new one every day. Um, Barney, kind of like me, you know, played one guitar the whole time. Okay. Uh, I, I, I switch. I'm like serially monogamous. I stay with one for about four or five years. And then one. But um, this guitar, I played with him, you know, back in the 70s. I mm -hmm. went on the road with him in the 80s. Hung okay. out with him a lot. And um, I would, after he passed away, I would go visit his widow in, in uh, San Diego. Mm -hmm. Her name is Phyllis. And uh, I would play it. She would bring it out just to hear it be played, but also yeah. to make sure it wasn't falling apart sure. in the case, because it was very valuable. And, um, ended up going to auction, but before she sold it, I had this idea. I said, you know, wow, John Clayton's got Ray Brown's bass. And then I worked for the Monterey Jazz Festival. I was in the all-star band and taught for them. I said, and the Jazz Festival has one of Shelley's sets of drums. I said, we could redo the poll winners, you know? Yes. And she was real excited about it until it, she realized it would mean that I would take the guitar, probably want to live with it and play with it, which means it would be out of her possession. And of course, I'd probably even want to set it up again, which would sort of take some of the collector's value away from it. Okay. I think she was thinking about it as a, you know, a big investment, something for retirement. Yeah. And so it never happened. I could see that she was uneasy about the whole thing. She liked the idea at first, and then the, as soon as the details uh, yeah. <laughs> emerged. Cool. And so, um, but it was, and so it's okay. I have an idea a day, so it's another one in the garbage, you know. And um, what ended up happening was this past May, I was driving to Santa Cruz, a club called Kumba Jazz Center, and... It's like Barney moved into my car. I mean, I'm driving there, and all of a sudden, Barney's sitting next to me. I mean, he didn't talk to me. It's not that weird. Yeah. But I just could feel his presence and was couldn't stop thinking about him. And I could even, like, smell his aftershave. He wore this <laughs> weird cologne. <laughs> and um, I was just like, I couldn't believe it. It was just, you know, why is this happening to me? You yeah. know? And I would think about the guitar, and I would think about, all, you know, Barney. And... Um, I got to Kumba and I realized that I'd played there with him like 35, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, ah, that's what it was, of course. But I played there like two dozen, three dozen times since then. Yeah. Never thought of it. So, and, and it, it really didn't leave me. Like I was kind of, still it's kind of like he came in the room with me. And so I just sent an email to the guy who actually had bought this guitar at auction. Yeah. Phyllis had put it at auction. They had gone to this guy who lived in Colorado. She became friends with him and introduced me, so I got to know him. Never did meet him, but um, and the guitar didn't sell for as much as I thought it would. I thought it was going to go for like a quarter million dollars oh, or something. Yeah. I mean, think of all the records this thing's been on and all the history besides being just owned by him. Right. I mean, yeah. this guitar really has done some iconic things. So. Uh, it, it went for a lot, but not as much as I thought. I didn't even watch the auction because it was so... It was like, you know, watching a friend get sold or something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and uh, anyways, so I just emailed the guy who got it. And I said, you're not going to believe this. I'm having this weird deja vu about Barney. I'm in this club. We play. I can't stop thinking of him. I said, I hope you're, you know, you're doing great. Hope you're getting along with the guitar. Yeah. If you ever decide to let it go, Please give me first crack. Cool. That's all I said. Yeah. Went and played the set. Yeah. Got off the set, looked at my phone. He'd emailed me back already. And he said, I can't believe you're emailing me now. This is, this is too weird. Just, I just decided, I just told my wife that I had decided 
to sell this guitar. And so how long after? This is like five, 10 years. After the auction. Oh, so yeah. you've been sitting on this for a while. Oh yeah, okay. we had it for a long while. Okay. I mean, I'd been through Colorado a number of times and invited him to my gigs and he just couldn't come. Yeah. I mean, so there's a lot of them. And like, I just can't believe you're contacting me. I mean, I realize it's a kind of a valuable piece and it's a strange thing. I, if anything happens to me, I don't, my wife and my kids won't know what it is or how to get rid of it, you know? Yeah. And he says, I really only bought it to kind of keep it away from collectors taking it out of the country or something. You know, he was kind of like, he's, he was from Hope, Oklahoma originally, as Barney was. And so uh, he said, man, I would love it if someone connected to Barney like you would have it. You know, he says, yeah. he says I'll tell you what. He said, uh, well, I, you know, he, they, you know, and he said, I'll tell you what. He says, give me what I paid for it. Come and get it. I'm not shipping it. Right. And if you give me a guitar lesson, you can have it. Yeah, so. And so I, and within two weeks, I was in the car driving to Colorado to go get it. Luckily, it was a time around Memorial Day when we were kind of opening up from COVID. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I could uh, book some gigs on the tour. So I like ended up working three or four gigs on that tour. Got it. And um, got the guitar, and, and we, you know, it doesn't play as good as it does now, but it was it was playable, and I played it some. I did my red guitar show, and um, got it, brought it back, and and as soon as I knew I was getting the guitar, I called John. Okay. I think I'd mentioned the project to them back when I had the first idea. They were all cool to do it, but you know, I said, hey, you remember that thing we talked about? You know, the, the poll winners. It's just, yeah, I said, let's do it. I said, okay, you know, I said, uh, you know, I figured it was great because COVID was kind of helping us because guys weren't on the road as much. Right. So to find time to get everybody in the same state, yeah. <laughs> you know, much less the same studio was, was a lot easier. But once I had the guitar, it was like Josh Smith, the great guitar player, has a really cool studio. We, the original studio is no longer there. So there was no, we could redo the poll winners, but we didn't have the studio, so but Josh right. had a room that was very similar to the one that Contemporary Records had. And we had pictures, yeah. so we knew what kind of microphones they used okay. and how they set up. Yeah. And uh, But we got a better drum set, because my friend Gary Hobbs up in... And that was what I was going to ask you. I, I know Gary from, yeah. from Portland. Yeah. So this drum, this leady drum set here... Is the one that yeah. Gary has, which and was actually 1962, I think. You know, it's on the... I know it's on the Doctari record, because it's actually on the cover playing it. Okay. And he's on the My Fair Lady... It's on the My Fair Lady record. And this is something that Shelly Mann owned. That's his... Yeah, that's his, his, his drum set. Shelly's drums. Yeah. Um, Gary got them from Mike Barone, who got them from Shelly. Got it, okay. And, uh, yeah, so that was a much older set of Shelly's drums than the Monterey Jazz Festival had. No. So we, you know, so Gary graciously got me those drums. That's good. And then, um, and then we all got together, it was like, by July we were in the recording studio. And when we did it, just like the pole winners, no rehearsal. I mean, I just basically, it was up to me to pick the tunes. Uh, we decided to grab the waltz, so John wrote an arrangement for that. John brought an original. I brought some originals. I had some standards reworked. There were a couple of things. I really liked the sound of the guitar and the bass playing lines together, mm -hmm. melodies. So I wrote a couple of kind of bebop-ish, you know, sounding things that I sent to John in advance so he could just shed them and get them under his fingers. Yeah. So he wouldn't have to read it. But everything else, we just showed up. Play the tunes, they learned them. We decided how to arrange them just like they did on the Pole Winners records. Yeah. And we made it. But every step along the way, Ben, it was like, this was easy. This was easy. You know, I did a Kickstarter campaign, right. which I'd never done before. Found out I kind of liked it and had a lot of fun doing it. And got like three times as much support as I right. thought I was going to get. Yeah. And so that made it easy because then I had funds with which to pay the guys well. and. You know, I mean, I had to come down to, you know, it was just like a lot, a lot of logistical stuff that you forget about because I don't make records that often, right. you know. Yes. Whatever you think they're going to cost, just multiply it by three and that's what they cost. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so uh, you know, I just, everybody was wanting to help. 
you know, and uh, and then we started getting gigs. We've got gigs now. I mean, it's like it became a band. Right. You know, be careful what you do. So there's a lot of, and I, I wouldn't necessarily put this project in, but there's been a rash of like legacy projects, right. you know, and like re-releases, just older material that's out there that, you know, May, you know, maybe Errol Garner wanted that to see the light of day. Maybe he uh, didn't I, want it I to see. A, it. I have a strong feeling about that. Right, and so <laughs> obviously, but, but I don't want to get kicked off Facebook like the yeah. last video we did. <laughs> <laughs> but this feels fresh, and it is fresh. Right, and so I mean, talk about how, if you wouldn't mind, like kind of how, how this differentiates from like other like what I would say legacy okay. projects. Okay, well, first of all. Um, you know, and it, you know, it's not just the legacy project, the world itself. I mean, my students at university, it's like, it seems like copying people right. has become a religion now. You know, this yeah. transcribing, copying what everybody else does. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like, I, I luckily I came up in a generation with, where that was sort of shunned. We all really did study everybody. I mean, it was hilarious. You'd be on the bandstand, if you started like playing somebody else's solo, you'd get shamed on the bandstand. <laughs> but you go to the bar and hang out, yeah. and the jukebox comes on, and we're all singing all the solos of all the records. It's not like we don't know them, or right. we didn't learn them. It's just, we just don't do that in public. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. That just informs our music, <clears throat> and we do what's happening. It would be like moment. a comedian like taking somebody else's bit, and you'd be right. like, well, okay. Yeah, right, yeah, I mean, so, but you need to learn from the masters, and we did. I mean, but it was a really interesting sort of di dynamic that's changed now. Um, and things have to change. And with those legacy projects, I didn't want to do a legacy project. This was more of a, the way I look at it is like the kids getting together and playing their parents' instruments. Right, yeah. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, I would love it just as much if they were pissed off at us for what we played <laughs> as if they loved it. Yeah. Because it's not about them. Right. It's about us. I right. mean, of course we love them. John was mentored by Ray. I was mentored by Bert. You know, Jeff was mentored by Shelley. You know, and we all played with each of them. I've mm -hmm. played, all three of us have played with all three of the others. Right. You know, I was in Ray's band with Jeff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like... It wasn't about that. It, of course, I mean, their instruments and, and playing, I mean, we they're just in us. Yeah. I can't get away from that. I mean, it's my, my all, everything I do is informed by those guys. Sure. But it was never, there was, there's only one tune on there that they even recorded as the poll winners. And I did it so differently that I felt it was okay. And I felt it was so much a tip to their sense of humor. Mm -hmm. That you was know. something I was going to ask you too. It's like <clears throat> in some of these tracks here, and you do explain in the liner notes, but there are some some curious uh, names of tunes here. I just uh -huh. wanted to kind of go over some of these with yeah. you, like "Feel the Barn," okay. for instance. Yeah. "Feel the yeah. Burn," yeah, right. But the barn, yeah, like "Feel the Barn." You okay. know what I mean? It's like it's a blues <laughs> and "Feel the Burn," "Feel mm -hmm. the Birdie," "Feel the Barn." You know, it's like you know, it's just everything. It's just sort of felt like it was right now. Yeah. So it, it was funny. Yeah. Okay. I thought, and I one of my little <clears throat> videos for my for my um, my Kickstarter, uh, I did it like a Bernie Sanders. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, comedy. yeah, yeah. Feel, yeah. And um, so so that was like feel the burn. That's where the feel the barn started. Right. Which like there were like, lawn signs, and I guess Bernie was pissed off because he had all these signs left over from his campaign, and he felt bad about it. You know all this garbage. <laughs> so he was giving them to me, and we were taking the E and making it an A, and you know feel the barn. Now he was at least promoting my project. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it's a parody video I made. It's yeah, up yeah. on my YouTube channel and um and so that's where that started and then i just had this cool blues that i wrote that's mm -hmm. how that i mean and barney's tune is like obviously based on the on, on the shell of bernie's tune oh right but barney castle and, and it's got a lot of barney isms in it mm -hmm. you know and that's those kinds of things are there and green dolphin street like those guys were funny i mean those guys were hilarious yeah. like, every one of them you know and uh, they would do silly shit and okay. like, you know, to kind of play the guitar and quote, you know, use use Malanguena and like some sort of Americanized flamenco mm. 
for Green Dolphin Street. It's just so much something that they're, you know, I'm sure they go, we should have thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's one of those, damn, why didn't we think of that? And like love potion number nine. And that's you know? that was and, and I, I had chose that one for a single <laughs> yeah. just based on the like, hmm, that tune as I like yeah. just just the you know, the the name recognition behind it and everything. I thought that was that was actually one of the more the more curious yeah. tunes to pick up. Is there a reason other than well, just the okay. kind of well, interesting? I love I actually like the song. The bridge is kinda of stupid, but yeah. but I, that's kinda of why I like it. And um, <laughs> and it it, it just had, has a groove, you know, it has a yeah. thing. I mean, you, you can't like play that and just not go to a space. Right, right. And so, uh, and, you know, Shelly played on Fever. Right. And so we kind of like, okay, we're going to do the Fever groove right. to Love Potion number nine. And of course, you know, swing it, which of course is going to insult everybody, but I'm good at that. Yeah. So... <laughs> Uh, that's kind of how it happened, and I met no resistance. When I brought that up, they all kind of looked at me and like, what? what? I said, yeah, mm -hmm. you'll dig this. Yeah. <laughs> and it's generally the one, of course, it's the last song, so, but a lot of people will call me and say, man, I've had that thing, there's an earworm for three days, you know, I can't get it out of my head, you know. So you mentioned that the band is, um, that it actually has come together a little bit more cohesively than you initially expected, and you're actually going to go out and play live, like what's kind of on the horizon right. for the band now. Well, we just all liked, the, we like each other, we've known each other for yeah. a long time, and the funny thing is, is we didn't realize until we were being interviewed for Downbeat, because they, they interviewed all of us together, we didn't realize that we had never played a trio before this session. I mean, I've played with John numerous projects. You never played with us in two. trio, yeah, in trio. but yeah. never with John and Jeff. Okay. Jeff and I, of course, we played trio with Ray's band. You know, I yeah. mean, I've played with Jeff on numerous record dates. You know, we had never played trio before, and we all kind of thought we had. Mm. I mean, it took the interviewer to ask us, "When did you?" And like, we never did. That's you know, and so, and so. Um, that was kind of, so the reunion is just the instruments. It's not us in, you know, classic sense of a trio. Yeah. But we really like each other. We really liked the project. Of course, something like this is unique and easy to move around. And of course, everybody's really busy, but we're getting calls and we're making room to do it. Good. And I'm excited about it. Yeah. You know, I really am, because it's not a bad rhythm section. No, John Clayton <laughs> and Jeff Hamilton. No, no. Yeah. So. Well, I'm looking forward to, to seeing y'all play live soon. That's going to be a treat. I'm really yeah, glad to hear yeah, that. Yeah, we, we got that. stuff coming up, and we, you know, the phone keeps ringing. So, you know, I'm going to keep playing it, and um, I'm going to keep playing this guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, I'm kind of the guy that sticks with one for a long time. What does it sound like? Well, it sounds pretty good. You know, at least I think it does. Um, yeah. It's 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 really kind of rare. I mean, for for geek guys, I think is is, is the amp still on? No, I turned it off. But um, uh, what's weird about it is like here is it's a es an es three fifty Gibson three fifty okay. es three fifty Gibson, which is um, was made in like nineteen forty six, <laughs> and as you can see. All the cracks on the sides. Mm -hmm. It's really been beaten up. It is also, I was on the road with him in a different band. He was with the Great Guitars and I was with the Monterey Jazz All Stars mm. when this neck got snapped oh, off. Okay, it's yeah. been. It's Put been, back on there. Yeah. And this pickup is uh, from a Charlie, it's a, called the Charlie Christian pickup. This is not the original pickup on the guitar. Okay. This is. Um, from like the 30s. Oh, wow. Late 30s. Huh. And actually, there's a great YouTube video called Barney Kessel Talks About His Guitar. Okay. And, and, he, and he just kind of gives you a tour about like the knobs and where he moved, you know, the, obviously he moved this one. See, it's in a different place. Yeah. And the bridge he had built for <laughs> it. This is the third fingerboard that's been on this guitar. <laughs> uh, wow. And he... Um, Covered over the Gibson logo, hmm. 
he got mad at them. They were giving him money or something. And yeah. they, they, made, they had a Barney Kessel model, and I don't think he liked it. And there, it was just mm. a lot of problems. So okay. he just said, Not you know. Bad. But if you look, like, you can probably see, okay. if you look, like, in the light, you can see the the inlays kind of sweat there. Out. Yeah, you can see the dot. Yeah. Was, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but the real weird thing about this guitar, and I think mostly the pickup, is how clear it is. Okay. I mean, Barney really had a, a very clear tone for like jazz players. Okay. Like a lot of them have a kind of a more dark, muffly sound. No, not hmm. muffly, just dark sound. Yeah. And then more the Jim Hall mode. And Barney always kind of gravitated more to a brighter okay. sound. Yeah, right? yeah. Right, so. And. You know, you can really hear. And like, to be able to play, like usually on a jazz box, that, as you probably, as you know, because you play with us so much, I mean, a low E will just fill up the room. Yeah, It's okay. almost like a bass. Yeah, you know, yeah. It almost sounds like it's about to feed back. Sure. And sure. listen how. But it's just right there. And I mean, this box is right in front of the speaker. I mean, no, usually this is like going to be howling. You okay. know, so that and and these kind of strings are called flat wound strings, mm -hmm. which are by nature deader and muddier, warmer sounding. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, they're very clear with this kind of pickup, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's really been fun to play it just because of the clarity and balance is so different from all the other guitars I've ever had. It's made okay. me kind of play it a different way, which mm -hmm. I just want to you know suggest to all the young musicians is that's a good thing to find things that make you play in new ways yeah i hear you. it's not a bad thing oh, okay. and um and so uh, especially when you get as old as me and so that's yeah the guitar is is it's heavy it's heavier okay. than most guitars of its ilk and um and there's like some I don't know. It's like fossilized tissue paper. Yeah, I was going to ask you about what that was. And it's like it probably rattled. You know, okay. it probably was in there loose and it would vibrate. Mm -hmm. And so he probably took some toilet paper and shoved it in there about 1958. <laughs> and it's kind of, gnarly. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, and like I say, all the cracks. Yeah. It looks like it's been. And this here, this is not normal. This, okay, yeah. This is uh, obviously been reinforced. What have, obviously a lot of these cracks, I think, probably happened in one incident huh. where it was sitting on a stand, okay. and somebody got their foot caught in the cord as they were walking by and pulled it off, you know, the stand and, and just broke. They practically pulled the top off, but also probably crushed in. The jack. This. Yeah. So they had to just reinforce it with metal, I would assume. I mean, I don't know. Uh, along with getting the guitar, I got a bunch of effects with of Barney's that went came hmm. in the auction, like letters from oh, okay. Jim Hall and Oscar Peterson and um, Brian Wilson, because, you know, he was in the Wrecking Crew. Right, he did yeah. a lot of that stuff. And so, um, yeah, he... Uh, he, you know, so there's a lot of cool artifacts that I have. One of which is a, the stupidest little stand, guitar stand. It looks like, remember those old music stands we have? Yeah. Like the little teeny thin metal. It's like a Sputnik you know, like, or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, like if you breathe too hard, they fall yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they couldn't hold anything heavy, you yeah. know. That was the kind of guitar stand that <laughs> probably this was on when <laughs> that happened. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's really interesting. It's, it's kind of a part of jazz that... I mean, what we, we've done with this project, you know, the poll winners to me are extremely important. We're important records. Mm -hmm. You know, they happened in, what, 1957, the first one came out, and they did it for four years because they started winning the polls in 56, all three of them. That was when the West Coast or the cool jazz or whatever you want to call it yeah. scene was happening. And, you know, of course, it was like a big shift, a big movement in jazz, but and you can see why it was what it was because like all of a sudden these jazz guys are on TV. I mean, you know, the, right. that, uh, what was that, Johnny Staccato and Perry Mason and all those TV shows started having jazz bands 
It was usually Barney and Shelley yeah. and Ray. As well as we're doing the Wrecking Crew stuff. Right, right. You know, so, so people were kind of more aware of these jazz musicians. Okay. You know, and they brought a lot of people to jazz, yeah. you know, obviously. But these poll winner sessions are particularly important for me and my fellow guitarists because they established the guitar trio. Mm -hmm. Like, there was no guitar-based drums really before that. I mean, I've been, I've been looking for it. Okay. I don't know of it historically, but I'm sure guys were doing it, but like recorded bands, playing bands, it was piano based drums, or it was guitar in an organ, sure. right? Yeah. Or it was guitar in a vibes, mm -hmm. or it was guitar, p guitar, piano and bass, you know, like Nat Cole and Ama Jamal and Oscar. Those were the kinds of bands guitars were in. Okay. And that was the function of the guitar mm -hmm. until the pole winner. Okay. And then Barney Kessel all of a sudden is like Oscar Peterson now, you mm -hmm. know, with the bass and drums. Yeah. And, and, you know, that was like huge for what that did to the world of music. I mean, five years later, Jim Hall is on a Sonny Rollins record. And now the whole world of modern jazz has changed mm -hmm. because now guitar based drums is, is a rhythm section instead of piano based drums. Well, jazz guitar is sort of. That, you know, those two things change jazz and change jazz guitar specifically. And, you know, I mean, Buddy Holly a year later after the bridge started, that was a guitar trio. Sure. And I mean, that extended to garage rock and, and grunge Jimmy bands Hendrix. and Nirvana. You and know, and of course, that, yeah. Leo Fender had a lot to do with it, too. But, um, you know, because guys could play louder. Right. But still, guitar based drums was not a thing before 50, 57 in the pole winners. And okay. so I just felt that that was a part of the music that I wanted to also make a reunion, you know, like to make an awareness of, to yeah. call attention to just how brilliant these guys were. And they made their record the way we made ours. They, you know, they showed up. They were probably working in the studios all day. Right. And they showed up at night because they had to record at night with contemporary records because the studio was in the warehouse. Oh, okay. So, you know, uh, Lester Koenig had a big warehouse okay. where all the records were. And where the office was, they had a another area where the studio was. So, right. that, you know, it was okay. kind of... And so they couldn't make records during the day if there were people moving boxes oh, and making that. a bunch okay. of noise, yeah. you know? So... And plus, the guys were all working during the day in the caves, in the studios. So they went and did their thing at night. And they would just show up, you know, and have their arrangements, have their ideas. They'd work them out. they play, you know, boom, they're done. You know, I mean, these guys knew what to do. And, and, and I think that that's a real, that's another side of the jazz experience that needs to be, uh, if not, you know, I'm not on, on a soapbox here trying to, you know, pontificate, but I do think it is a part of our music that needs to be celebrated. Yeah. You know, and uh, the reunion of that, you know, because things have a tendency to get a little, we're starting to get into this sort of heavily arranged, heavily competitive, heavily whatever, you know, produced world right. here. And it's like, remember when we just played music? Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. it was good enough for Charlie Parker. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a super fun record. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy it. It seems like everybody else, you know, that I talk to is enjoying it. Well, I'm really glad and I'm thankful for it. And um, who knows, maybe there'll be a reunion too. Yeah, maybe. Or, uh, you know, I'll find another historic instrument to, you know, make less valuable. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <Bruce. laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Great.